Well, good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk to you today about uh, reliability measures. Uh, and before I get directly into the measures, I want to I want to point out that that reliability measures, although they're very very important to any asset management program, there's some other key areas that that you need to be proficient in as well. And I'll I'll just very quickly go through those. Uh, just to make sure that everybody's uh, grounded in where reliability measures fit into the overall asset management arena. Uh, <clears throat> you certainly have to have a, a, a sound maintenance management program, which is looking at, at managing the uh, assets and managing the labor and materials that, that's required to, uh, to have a, a sound asset management program. <clears throat> I believe you have to have good reliability improvement methodologies to, uh, to uh, maintain a good asset management program, which includes root cause analysis and looking at, at continuously improving the reliability of your equipment. <clears throat> Configuration management, uh, many of you may have never heard these terms, but basically what configuration management is, is when you make changes to your operation, you, you have a, a process in place that manages those changes. Uh, it, it's similar to a management of change program, but not, not directly uh, compa comparable. But uh, <clears throat> basically, when you put in a new piece of equipment, uh, you have to change your drawings, change your, your uh, hierarchy in your CMMS, change your specifications, and, t and, and take out the old, uh, which is just as important. What we find and what we see when, when people don't have a good configuration management process is that over time, things like storerooms become filled with, with obsolete materials. Drawings are outdated. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a poor way to run a, a, an operation, not having a way to keep things current. Good planning and scheduling is very crucial to a sound asset management program. And what I mean by planning and scheduling, I'm talking about the actual work that's being done each day uh, should be should have a schedule. And there's a lot of folks out there that schedule, but uh, not very many of them that really do a good job of planning step by step what we're going to do and estimating the time frames that they're being done that they're going to be done in and measuring the, uh, the 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 results of that whether we are doing a good job of estimating and, uh, or, or not. <clears throat> Operations management has to be uh, very good. They have to, to, uh, to, to do what, they're, what they say they're going to do. They shouldn't be running equipment till it's, uh, till it's uh, broken and ask us to, to, to fix it. Uh, they need to be part of the asset management program and actually run, it, run equipment the way it's designed to be run. And in many industries, <clears throat> you have uh, process safety management issues uh, that, that have to be met. Uh, there's legislation and rules to be followed in that arena, so you can't ignore that. So with that, let's get into the, to the, to the actual measures. Uh, the first one is uh, overall equipment effectiveness. Uh, and what I'm going to do is give you <clears throat> the measure, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what, it, what it's actually measuring and how to go about that measure. And I'm going to give you a target that uh, would be considered world class. Uh, overall equipment effectiveness is basically looking at the, the uh, time losses, speed losses, and quality losses in your operation. And uh, if there's any questions about OEE, I'll, 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 be, uh, I'll answer those at the end of the session. But it's, it's aimed at manufacturing. And 85% is, is a great target for OEE. Now, bear in mind, when I, when I give you these targets, these are not absolute. These are, these are targets of, of, of what have been recognized as, uh, as world-class performance. And it, and it may be that in your operation, it's not physically possible to reach some of these targets. So the targets aren't absolute. Uh, I, I think it's important for us to, to, to recognize that that uh, if, if we start imposing targets upon people, uh, we might not get what we bargained for. So 85% is a good target, uh, and, and, 
and we'll we'll get into some questions about that later on. Let's talk about backlog for a moment. <clears throat> backlog is is a very very critical element to to run a, a sound asset management program. And what I mean by backlog is how much work do we have in front of us in all work categories. I'm talking about in PM work, in corrective work, in work that's been requested by operations, how much work do we have in our CMMS, in our backlog? And, and it's in two categories. Ready, ready backlog is work that's ready to be scheduled. Uh, we've already done the estimating, we already have the job plan in place, and it's simply a matter of placing it on the schedule. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the other thing that I, I find people doing with backlog is measuring it in terms of how many work orders are in that backlog. Well, that doesn't really mean much because, as you well know, one work order may represent 30 minutes and another one may represent 200 hours. So backlog has to be measured in, in hours, in work hours, to be effective. Now, <clears throat> managing your backlog to two to four weeks of ready backlog and four to six weeks of, of total backlog is, is very critical to, to stand ahead of things. What happens to most people in the area of backlog is their backlog, in many cases, is growing faster than their ability to work that backlog off. So what happens is over time, they get further and further behind. Uh, I've seen operations that had total backlogs of two years. In other words, their total workforce would take two years to work off the backlog that they have. What that means is what you're telling your operations partner is that it's going to be two years before you get to the next low priority job. And we all know what that means. We lose our, our, our credibility and those jobs that we've recognized as, as corrective jobs and requested jobs that we had the luxury of doing before they became breakdowns will ultimately become breakdowns. So <clears throat> backlog is one of those things that, that, that every maintenance supervisor should, should hold dear to his heart to make sure that they understand exactly what they have in front of them and balance the workforce or the workforce with the workload. Total inventory value. Uh, there's a there's a benchmark of 0.5 to 0.75 percent of replacement asset value. Uh, <clears throat> this 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 is not a an, an absolute number, and and it's pretty high level, but it'll get you in the ballpark. And uh, if you don't know what replacement asset value is, ask your your financial folks. If they don't know the replacement asset value, they certainly will know the, the uh, insured value, and that'll get you fairly close. But we want to look at 0.5 to 0.75 percent of uh, replacement asset value as, as the total inventory value. Store service. What I mean by that is when someone goes to the store to get a part or a part is reserved to a work order, 98 percent of the time that, that part should be available and, uh, and, and, and ready to be used in the operation. Uh, <clears throat> we would hope it to be 100%, but things aren't perfect. 98% is, is probably as good as we've seen in industry. Mat materials delivered to the job site. If you don't have this function of, of uh, delivery of materials to job sites, what ends up happening is your, your craftsmen are the ones that go to get the parts. And uh, in many cases, they're pretty high-paid folks, and, and I don't know that that's the best use of their time is standing at the stores when they're waiting for parts to go do their work. So if you don't have a material delivery uh, function in your plan or facility, I would suggest that you uh, str strongly suggest you take a look at that. <clears throat> so stores turns per year. Uh, th these are items that... Uh, that you use as a routine part of, of doing maintenance, be very careful with, with this two to three turns per year because there are parts in your storeroom, for instance, uh, spares for, uh, for critical equipment and things that, uh, that you have 
in inventory as insurance. Uh, truth is, you don't ever want to use them. A good example would be, I suspect most of you have a, 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 a spare uh, main feeder breaker for your uh, electrical systems. And I tell you, <clears throat> I'm sure you don't want to change one of those two to three times a year. So be careful applying the two to three turns per year to critical or insurance spares. The next two, uh, the next three measures are how you spend your time. Uh, in, a, in a very good maintenance program, about 30% of your total time should be in preventative hours. Preventative hours, what I mean by preventative hours are, are uh, time-based PMs uh, and corrective, uh, uh, or I, I take that back, com condition-based monitoring. And if you got more uh, time-based PMs than you have uh, condition monitoring, you're, you're behind the curve. It should be the other way around. There are many wonderful technologies out there in condition monitoring uh, that, that most people don't take advantage of. Infrared, vibration, ultrasound, uh, and many, many others. Uh, people only use those superficially when the fact is the majority of your preventive maintenance program should be in condition monitoring. So from that preventive work, you should generate 50 to 60 percent of your workload from the as corrective work from PM, and non-maintenance hours should be about zero. Uh, and, and what I mean by, by non-maintenance hours, I've seen operations that have their maintenance people doing snow removal and grass cutting uh, and clean up after events and those kind of things. Well. I'm not going to tell you that, that you shouldn't do that. What I am going to tell you is that you should budget for those things and make it a maintenance function and provide the resources to get it done. Too many times those things are thrown in uh, to on top of maintenance budgets that, that didn't have provisions for them when they, were, when they were put together. Unscheduled maintenance hours should be 10% or less. Uh, we should have about 90% uh, of our work planned and scheduled. Uh, On-the-job supervision should be above 65%. What I mean by that, more than at, at least 65% of our jobs should have a supervisor visit them while they're being done or at the end of the job to, uh, to, to look at what uh, the condition that the job was left in. Uh, too many times our supervisors are, are overloaded with administrative work and other responsibilities, and they don't really have time to do this. And it's not really looking over people's shoulder. It, it's taking a look at, at did we meet the expectations? Do we have any training needs out there? Uh, if our supervisors don't have time to spend with their people, then I don't. we, we, we can't expect uh, our, our, our workforce to improve very much.